thank you for being back with us. So our next panel is going to explore the gender and climate nexus. And moderating this panel is Nina Gardner. She's the Corporate Sustainability Advisor, a professor, and activist. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's sort of getting back from the unintended break we had. We have a very exciting panel coming up, so I hope. So should we give them one more minute? Should we give them one more minute? Should we start? OK. So uh, this panel is all about uh, women at the heart of climate action, which is sort of the, one of the burning issues, speaking of burning, um, of, of our time. And we are very lucky to have uh, not only three extraordinary panelists in, in, in the room, but we also have uh, a, an, a new a congresswoman, a representative from Alaska, who will be joining us. Oh my God, there she is. Will be joining us uh, um, through this hybrid system. This is great. Uh, Congresswoman, I was so excited when you got elected. Uh, this is Congresswoman Mary Sattler Peltola, and she is the first Alaskan native to be <laughs> elected to Congress. And this is. A major accomplishment. I don't know if you all follow U.S. politics, but this is this is a major accomplishment. And she's a Democrat, so thank you. <laughs> As a U.S. Demo American Democrat, I'm happy. Um, you have um, you started at the you started as an intern at the state legislature uh, when you were only 24, correct? And you were bitten by that public service bug and decided to run. Correct, um, and then uh, so you and you, she run won, she won her first state election when she was 24. Okay, and then. Um, she is a member to Forward Fast. She's a member of uh, the uh, class of what we call the 118th Congress as a freshman plus class because she won in a uh, in an election to represent to uh, to replace Representative Don Young in uh, the August of 2022. But then she ran in November and was reelected, and she is extremely popular in her district. Um, we are. We are here, uh, Congresswoman, to talk about women at the center of climate action. And we have some wonderful activists and someone from the State Department who will be coming on shortly. But we have seven minutes together to talk about what you're seeing. You're on ground zero in Alaska on uh, climate uh, activity. Uh, Surely, the uh, Alaskan natives are, are feeling this firsthand, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what's going on in your district and beyond, because we're worried about what's going on in Alaska. So please uh, clue us in. Thank you so much, Nina. Yes, Agasunga, uh, Mamdrisakamungunga. Um, my name is Agasak. My English name is Mary Peltola. I'm a Yupik Eskimo from Bethel, Alaska. Our, the real name of the town that I'm from is called the Place of Many Fish Caches. Oh, so that gives you an indication that we are salmon people. We are fish people. Our generic word for fish is also our generic word for food. We're very tied to our fish research, our marine resources, and we are seeing tremendous change in, in a very short um, window here. Um, we had five snowless winters in Alaska consecutively. This was about uh, three or four years ago. This year we have a lot of snow, which is wonderful. But my when my now 19-year-old son was 16, he made the observation that he hadn't gone ptarmigan hunting. Ptarmigan are a bird, it, um, is a bird in Alaska. It's our state bird and it's like a grouse. But he said, mom, I haven't gone ptarmigan hunting since I was nine. So that really is um, an example of um, one of the impacts. And, and just a little, just a tiny bit about ptarmigan. So ptarmigan turn white in the winter. They're, they turn colors um, based on where the sun is and the horizon, the 
um, cold, darker months, they turn white to match the snow. And then in the summer, they're kind of a brown color. And they sleep in the snow in, in the winter. They burrow there and they actually get fatter in the spring um, while, they're, while they have that as um, a burrowing place. And not having snow, not only did it make it hard for them to to find a place to sleep, but it made them easier prey for fox and um, hawks and things like that to see because they were white on brown. Um, our willows are growing really fast. Um, we've and the other issue with having snowless winters is it, it it does impact our salmon because we're used to having that all of that snow melt continuously melting and cooling our river. So in 2020, I believe, we had very, very hot temperatures in our water and we had salmon that were dead, unmolested, um, kind of drifting down the river. Um, hey, um, Anton, could you close this window for me? I'm getting some some weird shading. But um, so what was happening was these chum salmon were having heat stroke because the water temperature was in the 70s, in the mid-70s Fahrenheit, and they really needed to be much, much colder. Um, and what we've seen across the state is there a lot of concern about an ecosystem collapse based on our Bering Sea being very unproductive the last 10 years or so. So we had, we've had we had a real decline in our salmon abundance. We are short on halibut. We had a complete crab collapse this year. And not only do these have substantial economic implications, but it real these things really are our identity and our source of food security. So it's had tremendous cascading effects. And we've been short on salmon in our part of Alaska for 13 years, and we've been down to 20% of our need. The Yukon River has had no salmon fishing for the last three summers. And these are people who live along the Yukon River and have for 12,000 years, and this is documented Western science, um, confirmed that um, Alaska Natives have been living on that river for 12,000 years, really because of this relationship and dependence upon salmon. So that's, um, I could go on and on about, you know, we have tremendous um, tundra fires in the summer um, and many other things. Well, I, 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 I didn't note when I was introducing you that you were the executive director, and I'm going to get this wrong, of the Cusco Wim River Intertribal Fish Commission, and you mobilize 118 tribes to try and advocate for the protection of the salmon runs uh, in western Alaska. So, I mean, if they're not dying, at least you're trying to protect them, but it's sort of hard to protect them from changing climate, right? So uh, I don't know how you go about protecting them if everything is just heating up. Well, and when I was growing up, they call it a spawner recruit ratio. So for every salmon that spawned, six would come back. And what we're finding now is for every salmon that spawns, less than one comes back. So this is showing that we're having real serious concerns about what happens both after the eggs have been laid. You know, if we don't have snow, there isn't that blanket of warmth and the headwaters can freeze all the way to the bottom. So those fish fry can freeze in place and not make it. And then um, changing things in the Bering Sea. Um, so all of this means that we need to make sure we have more eggs in the gravel, that we're allowing more fish to, to get up to the headwaters, and we really have to um, decrease some of the pressure on them. And, and this is really why I ran for Congress, to really elevate the, the um, awareness of our food insecurity issues across the board in Alaska. It's, it's really amazing how secret this issue is. Well, not secret no longer because we're at the Women's Forum and it's being live streamed. I don't know, and and at Vital Voices, so this is going uh, all over the world. But I would be remiss if I weren't at to ask you a hard question, uh, and that is, you were advocating for the this Willow Project, which is an eight billion dollar drilling project in Alaska, uh, Conoco Phillips. It's one of the largest oil projects in uh, onshore in the United States. I must admit today, 
Biden announced another one um, in the in the Gulf um, of Mexico. Uh, but how how do you square that with all of the conservation efforts you've been making um, for your people? Well, and and this is not something that is an easy decision. This is, you know, in some ways on the economic side, it's very easy, but. It, it, is, it, it is more nuanced. Um, the state of Alaska, we are very dependent on resource extraction to balance our budget. The state of Alaska is required to pay for education, public safety, and public transportation. Over 80% of the money that Alaska has um, in their coffers is from petroleum extraction. That is a huge dependence on petroleum and, and those royalties. And we have an oil pipeline, we're, we're down to a quarter of the capacity. And at some point that oil in the, when, when you get to a certain level, it becomes like chapstick in the winter. There's just not enough flow for it to keep going. So that's a concern. We have um, a narrowing amount of reserved money, rainy day accounts. So that's one piece of it. A another piece for me is, although we are seeing firsthand these consequences, I don't think it's fair for the world to ask Alaska to be closed for business and then keep going as if it, nothing is wrong in other places and then relying on oil that is extracted in much less humane ways and in, in less envir environmentally protected ways. We, we really are very um, ethical about environmental impacts and making sure that we're providing livable wages. We are only doing construction in the winter season so we can use ice roads so we don't impact sensitive tundra. There are a lot of protections built into the way that Alaska does our resource extraction. And why would we forego that in favor of purchasing oil from countries that are not democratic. They are adversarial to democratic countries. They are not good in terms of humanitarian issues or environmental issues like um, Iran, China. Venezuela, um, Saudi Arabia, China, yeah, places. on and on. And so there are national security issues and it doesn't make sense for us to say no to um, responsible development in favor of irresponsible development because we have, you know, and I am very, very in favor of transitioning to renewable and more affordable energy, but we cannot do that in a snap. And we need gap oil. And there is a broad recognition that we need gap oil and it is going to take us years to make that transition. One of the biggest impediments right now is uh, lack of human capital. We don't have people who are trained to put in these projects and maintain these alternative energy sources. And it's very frustrating for me because when I served in the legislature for 10 years, 15 years ago, we were on the cusp, we were really leading the way in transitioning. We were putting in um, wind mills. We are leaders in implementing solar whole neighborhoods, getting solar panels and putting that energy back into the grid. Um, but, it, and so much of that technology is off the shelf and affordable. We just don't have people to do it. And um, across America, we just have this tremendous um, dependence on petroleum. And if you think about every single thing that we have and we use, it's delivered by diesel, whether it's train, plane, barge, or semi-truck, all of those things need diesel fuel. Okay, I was, I'm afraid we've got to, to stop. I would love to continue this conversation because we, we <laughs> We can bring the human capital to Alaska to make sure there's more renewables. The IRA should have, the Inflation Reduction Act should help 
Alaska um, on its reserves. There's so many other ways that we can avoid drilling uh, because the IEA, as you know, has said no new drilling uh, if we're to keep to our 1.5 uh, Paris uh, commitments. You're in between a rock and a higher hard place, I understand that. So thank you for giving us your perspective. I wish you were here to continue the conversation, but maybe next time when we're in the United States, you'll come in and talk to us in person. This was uh, really, it was, thank you for making the time. Thank you, Nina. It was good to be with you. All right, now uh, we will we will continue with our conversation. We have uh, some extraordinary um, panelists, sorry. Um, and I'd, I'd like to invite to the stage. So in order, sorry. Kate Guy, who is a senior advisor of the State Department on climate change, and she's going to be giving us a little bit of the overview, um, the scientific overview of uh, the impacts of climate change uh, worldwide. Um, and uh, Hindu, next, uh, Ibrahim, climate activist and coordinator, Association of the Peel Women and the autochthonous people of Chad, who has come back from Panama with all sorts of Good luck symbols uh, for this conference. And uh, last but not least, we have Hilda, who's uh, Flavia, I love this Italian in between the uh, middle name, Nakabuya, who's an activist and founder of Fridays for the Future in Uganda. And so I would uh, love for all of you to, uh, we're going to start with, um, sorry, Kate, who is going to give us a an overview of um, why we should care about greenhouse gas emissions and methane because you are a climate scientist, you are, you've been working also with the military in terms of the whole security aspect of cli climate, which is extremely important, um, not to mention what these uh, wonderful activists are feeling on the ground uh, in terms of change in Africa. So maybe you can sort of set the stage now that we've heard about the tensions with the political um, uh, representatives here because they're, the political representatives are dealing with the short-term uh, tensions of providing economic development, but we've got medium, I wouldn't even say long-term, climate crisis looming on the horizon. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Just sure, to be thank optimistic. You. <laughs> thank you, Nina. Happy to. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, as Nina said, I'm Kate. I'm a political appointee with the Biden administration working on uh, the team for Secretary Kerry, our special envoy for, for climate change, uh, as well as uh, for the, the Secretary of State and Assistant Secretary of State there. So it's a it's a big topic. It's a big portfolio. Um, we, since coming in and, and being elected and, and joining in 2021, have been you know, pedal to the metal of the electric car and trying to do everything, everything that we can uh, domestically as, as um, folks in the White House know, and then as well as internationally to get where we need to go. Uh, because what's unfortunate, the politics are hard, of course. The politics have always we been saw hard, that. We just are getting that. more difficult. The science is not hard. The science is frankly quite easy. That's not true. The scientists will not, wouldn't tell you that. But what is what is plain as day um, and what is getting sort of more clear is that the impacts of climate change are actually happening faster and more in intense than we even thought they would have 10 years ago, 20 years ago. We heard some of the, what that looks like from Alaska perspective, but we're seeing it all around the world, right? I mean, uh, just in the past few weeks, Vanuatu, tiny island in the Pacific, was hit twice back to back with very intense cyclones in the Pacific. That's at the same time that a country like Mozambique in Africa was also hit twice back to back with um, sort of un, you know breaking the scale uh, cyclones as well in Africa. Right? We know what that that has looked like here at home in the U.S. with wildfires getting more intense, longer. Um, we had wildfires here on the East Coast in in North Carolina just last week that were blowing into Washington D.C. And if you need a, a sort of uh, image of what that looks like, you know, be in the halls of, of power here in D.C. having climate change conversations in March where you have smoke blowing in from, from wildfires where there never would have been before. Uh, I, I don't need to tell probably the folks in this room that the impacts are, are severe. What I am here to say, though, is that those impacts are most severe 
women and girls in vulnerable communities. Um, as Samantha Power, the director um, of our uh, international agency for, for development here in the US said at COP one year, climate change is sexist. And I think we all can feel that um, and see that because in any community where you have unequal balance of power, uh, unequal um, uh, discrimination against any group, once you put a little bit more pressure on that society, a little bit of disaster, or a little bit more sort of humanitarian impact, it's al almost always going to be the vulnerable communities there that are bearing that brunt. Um, and that is what we're seeing around the world. We were just talking before the panel about uh, the Sahel in Africa and Chad, where you have um, uh, increasingly communities sort of dealing with water insecurity and food insecurity and increasing conflict between pastoral communities and, and agricultural communities where there weren't those pressures before, right? Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of wrap up this bit quickly and, and say, um, as Nina said, I work generally at that intersection of security and climate change, right? What the military is, is doing, what our national security community, what the intelligence community is looking at as threats to, you know, in our sense, the American national security um, uh, uh, sort of analysis. And they are seeing climate change as the, some of the top security threats to this nation now, not just 30 years in the future, not 50 years in the future, um, but they're affecting our men and women in uniform who are trying to protect our country and they're affecting our sort of geopolitical safety around the world. Um, and that is because once we take this look of human security, you know, not just military security, but human security, food security, security of our water systems into account, we realize that those systems are stressed like never before. And those are threats to our safety and our economic security as a, as a society, really. So it's bleak, it's bleak. Um, but what we also know is that there is a way, there is a path to stay at you know, no more than 1.5 degree Fahrenheit. There is. Um, we, we have that in front of us. We know that that means decarbonization um, by 2050, and that's, you know, net zero is, is what we all, most nations in the world have pledged. Um, it's the Paris Agreement, which we've all signed up for. It's uh, working to implement those commitments, which we in the US finally have, you know, historic domestic climate change leg legislation in the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's actually meeting those commitments and keeping that ambition going with each passing year, not letting up, but actually saying now we need to double down more and get even those harder to abate sectors like methane, as you as you mentioned, um, and and a few others. So I'll, I'll stop there, but looking forward to the discussion with, yeah. with you as well. I mean, it's, it's really difficult, as you can imagine, because you've got uh, Kerry's team and Biden's team working very hard, and then you, you have um, these kinds of new projects um, in Alaska, and today another project was announced of, uh, they'll be drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, an area the size of Italy uh, that's gonna be, they're gonna be drilling. And so I know that you're not responsible for that, but I'm saying it's very hard to see us meeting those 1.5 commitments if uh, people, countries that are supposed to be leading like the United States are not, and I'm not saying that, you know, we're the only ones breaking uh, some of these, uh, we're not we're not breaking our agreements yet, but I don't feel very comfortable about the fact that we've, um, we've, we've stopped drilling because we haven't. Um, and at some point, someone's going to have to show leadership. And so we need to put some serious money, and I'd like to see some of these businesses put serious money in some of the, the more renewable energy that we have, we have technology. So we should stop the Conoco Phillips of this world and all these other oil and gas companies that had record profits this year, by the way, uh, should not have, should not be continuing to drill. But don't get me started. <laughs> I will now, but thank you for everything you're doing because, um, and we will talk about also oceans because you're, you, you're, you're also dealing with oceans. So we'll first do above land and then we'll work on oceans. So, so I, I'd like to, to, to um, ask Hindu who has been uh, really uh, in the trenches on this as an activist. You're gonna try and give us a little hope on what's going on in Chad or is it um, all bleak? Because I know the thing is women are mostly affected. We heard about this early on um, in, the, in the previous sessions, but women are also part of the solution. 
And so um, let's hear a little bit, if possible, about how you're, you're seeing, how you're affected and your people are affected and uh, what kind of solutions you're coming up with. Because you've been very involved in, in some of the cops and, and, and really taking a world stage as an activist and a leader from Africa. So thank you in advance for what you're doing, uh, but can you give us a few more examples of what you, what you do and what you're planning to do? Thank you, Anya Lijam. It's really a great pleasure to be with all of you here. As uh, she said earlier, I just uh, come this morning from Panama. And I went to the indigenous communities who are called the people Ambera. So that's where I get my tattoo because the indigenous women there, when I talked with them and I told them I'm going to come and see you. So they talked about the climate change. So what am I going to bring? So I bring this one. It's going to stay like two weeks with me, but I don't care even two years because this is what I have to do to talk on behalf of all the indigenous peoples around the world, not only my people. And this is part of also my culture. So coming back to your questions, I start by your conclusions. It's so hard and it's so like unacceptable to see what developed countries continuously doing while we are talking about the climate impact in general and the impact in the women in particular. How it's come, they are not developed, they are not looking for development, they are overdeveloped. What are they looking for? We have the technology of renewable. And we are just to want to unwilling to destroy the nature more and more. So which kind of lesson are they going to give to the developing world? Are they going to say like, stop, don't do all the duty things? Our people need development. So I think they must lead by example. And this is very frustrating for me when I just hear like this morning there is another new in Mexico, let's go to the Mexico, let's go to Africa, let's go to there. We need, we need more and more fossil fuel. And we are the one who are saying we need to act about climate change. We are not coherent in our mind. We are not coherent in our action. And that's what affecting our people back home. I come from Chad. My, my country is in the Sahel. My community are pastoralist cattle helders. We live after the rain. We are following the rainfall to get pasture for our cattle that can give us milk, that can give us food, and then that give us also a economy. But we are seeing that in our life, how the environment is destroying and changing our lifestyle, changing our society. In my community, I'm seeing that men are running from the communities, going to the cities, internal displacement and migrations, and external migration also that are causing the insecurity that Katie is talking about it. So then women are left behind with the children that have to fight in them on to ensure the security, to play the role of man, to ensure the food security, to keep the children, to think about giving them hope for the future. So how the other countries can have their mind in continuously damaging our nature? Their actions of all the developed world, Europe, US, China, and all, are impacting our people back home. And our people who are impacted, we are just like standing up, saying we are not the victim. We are the solutions. We have to lead the way. And that's what we are doing in my communities every single day. Our grandmothers and grandfathers, they are the ones who are leading the battles through our traditional knowledge. For us, it's the big hope. But is that the big hope for the developed world who have all the facility in their hands? I give you just one example. We use the science that are built by the developed world, technology with the traditional knowledge to make a solutions. I did a 2D or 3D participatory mapping. It is the exercise when we use the satellite imageries. They have the best information, the team, but our grandmothers have the better information than the best satellite imageries that they have in the world. Mm -hmm. Because our grandmothers can give you the details that the satellite image cannot give you. They can tell you if the tree is giving the fruit, giving the, uh, giving the flowers, if from the trees that they are the diversity of the birds, of the insect, 
They can tell you the water during the dry area. They can tell you if it's going to float around this place. And those knowledge, we combine them with science, and we build the capacity of the peoples. And they share the resources among themselves because they cannot fight, they can use this tool. So those solutions are very innovative and they are done most of the time by women. But what is the role of the women at the international level when we talk about climate change? We are not in the table yet to take the decisions. And I would love to follow up in your second question on this. Okay. But I think the world needs to think about we take the solutions, they have also to take the solution. We cannot anymore caution the damage to uh, the nature that they are causing to us. You're, uh, bravo. I totally agree. And it's asking too much of the people on the ground because we need to have more decision makers, more women decision makers. Maybe Kate will be a decision maker um, one day and making those important decisions in the US government. Um, but. We now, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. Uh, we got gypped out of time for our session. But Hilda, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing? You're 25 years old. OK, I'm going to make it public. But you are doing this, the Fridays for the Future. Tell us what you're doing on the ground in Uganda to really raise awareness for what is, for what is becoming a, a climate emergency. So uh, I come from a farmer's village in the basin of Lake Victoria in Uganda. Uganda is a country that British once called the Pearl of Africa. And uh, growing up, I didn't have so much of an education because I missed most of my classes uh, because of climate change. It devastated my family's garden, which was our main source of income, and they couldn't pay my tuition fees. But I got uh, the opportunity to join university where I learned that climate change is a very big challenge affecting humanity. And when I learned about that, I started uh, Fridays for Future Uganda. It's uh, women or girl-led uh, and youth, and it's a, a non-profit uh, fighting for climate justice. And we have a network of over 53,000 students and youth in Uganda. We have been able to do certain actions, influence policy, uh, philanthropy, uh, carry out climate uh, actions that provide solutions to our communities. And uh, I, we carry out climate strikes where we go to the roadsides, create climate awareness. We go to communities that are affected by climate change and brainstorm and uh, implement solutions towards a changing climate. We create climate education in schools, uh, especially to girl children, because research shows that 80% of people affected by climate change are women and girls. So we engage more women in our work. And uh, we clean Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is the second uh, biggest freshwater body in the world. And it's also the source of the longest river, River Nile. And over 40 million people depend on that lake for survival. So we carry out a cleanup on this lake to have it, uh, uh, to share this resource with generations to come because it's being highly polluted at the moment. And we want to see this resource also uh, give life uh, to more generations. And we, as Fridays for Future, we also lead uh, on a project that uh, increases uh, food security in drought hit areas in Uganda, where we train 100 women uh, to have their own sources of food. And with that, we train them to start uh, sustainable food gardens. These food gardens are for vegetables. And these women are able to grow these vegetables by themselves and then pack them uh, in, in bags so that when the drought period comes, they have enough food in store for their families so they don't have uh, to face that diverse effects of climate change, you know, moving long distances, uh, being beaten up by their men because they can't provide food, uh, having their kids uh, out of school because they are malnourished and, you know, other effects of climate change. And I also uh, strike or create awareness about the East African crude oil pipeline, which is a project led by Total Energies. Well, another that is, pipeline, guys. Uh-oh. Yeah. All right. This is Total in Uganda. 
Yes, uh, that's Total Energies. It's a, a French oil giant. So I create awareness about this pipeline and call for solidarity from people and for also global action because this pipeline is passing through our backyard. We are already facing the impacts of climate change. We can't bear the risk of the pipeline. And I also uh, create climate awareness on events like this where I represent women voices, uh, girls' voices in my communities. Thank you. Well, this is a little depressing, but thank you very much for what you do. Um, we have uh, not that much time, but I wanted to ask uh, all of you, and I want to start with Kate, um, how many women are in the State Department dealing with climate change, or on and either in the State Department or on Kerry's team? Um, is there a disproportionately higher number of women or not? There are a lot, but I wouldn't say that's enough. No, it's <laughs> I never think enough. we need, yeah. we always need more. Um, it, it has been, I, there have been moments where you sort of get chills actually to see the, the U.S. negotiator who just, I, you hopefully have seen, we negotiated and agreed to a new high seas treaty. So talk about the ocean just a few weeks ago. Uh, three incredible women on representing the U.S., you know, with that flag be behind um, us negotiating that treaty. And um, same thing in a climate space. There are, are many more women in senior positions than ever before. And I think part of that is because, and that's in, that's also sort of on the Pentagon side, if we're talking about yeah, climate important. and security, it's, it's an incredible majority female team leading that effort there. All of which is, I would say personally, you know, not with my government hat on, but it's because I think we as women are, and, and female identifying people are, often ones more drawn to those complex issues, those longer term issues, want to uh, sort of get get in the weeds of, of the, the hard stuff and uh, sort of challenge the narrative. And I've, I've seen a lot of women uh, growing up doing that. Um, but I also sometimes think too, it's like we, we've made some progress, but clearly from this conversation, we have so much further to go, and I think it's going to be the young female leaders, um, as, as we are here, rising up and seizing that mantle and saying, it's been a lot of progress, but it's been too slow, and uh, the problems are getting worse, and we'll look at that hard on and, and uh, sort of do what needs to be done. Okay, well, the two seconds, because we've got a pretty much of a hard stop. I don't want to be unfair, but just quickly, um, you know, if you, are there enough women in this decision making power and what would you like to see? Like 30 seconds from each of you. I think if there are enough women, we will not going to be in these climate uh, problems. I, I totally think agree. what I wanted to see, more women to be not only as checking box, but to sit in the tables, take the decision, and what they are saying can matter for politicians, can matter for the scientists, can matter for the communities where we are building the solution every single day. Hilda, you're going to close this out. Yes. <laughs> OK, uh, I think we need uh, more women. I don't think I know that we need more women, because uh, we couldn't be having uh, projects such as Willow, such as the ECOP, and many other developing, because women, uh, we, since we face these effects, we can draw on our experiences to offer solutions. And women can't be taking such decisions, because they know that they are the caretakers of us, and they have to make the best decisions. So that is what we need, representation. Yeah, more women, because they are the most impacted group. So thank you very much for this extraordinary panel. We could go on for hours, I'm sure. But thank you very much, all of you.